So Rob, a little while ago, we did the Back Attacks Formula app, DVD, maybe someday streaming online instructional as part of a jiu-jitsu formula program, essentially. Yeah. And in that instructional, you advocated going to the strong side when you're attacking the back. But I know, because I'm your friend, that you've been working a lot on your weak side attacks recently. So what's the deal? Were you completely wrong before? Uh, no, I, I would say that the same way as with certain scientific things, where new discoveries don't necessarily replace old discoveries. So, for instance, the, uh, the standard model of physics hasn't been replaced by quantum physics. We, we still understand that gravity is a thing, even though we don't... Anyway, I won't get into too many nerdy things. But we're adding on to the information. So for beginners, I believe, and, and uh, we don't, not just beginners, for experienced practitioners, I believe, if you don't have a foundation in attacking the strong side, then having a weak side only series of attacks is going to be more limiting and harder to learn. We discussed the, con the concept of uh, direct rotational control and lever-based rotational control in the core concepts volume of the formula. And the weak side attacks rely much more heavily on lever-based rotational control, which requires more subtlety. It requires... And which we'll show examples of in just a minute. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, it just... Uh, yeah, like, when people come to my club, if you're in the uh, BJJ 101 class, which is our fundamentals class, you're going to learn the basic positions in jiu-jitsu and some movements. One of those positions is the back. We do not cover weak side attacks in that. I still believe, especially as a beginner, direct control is easier for you to grasp and conceptualize because you're just holding on to something. Um, the amount of subtlety involved in lever-based control, even though you do need to learn it, is greater. Uh, I also do still believe that there are body type issues with the weak side. If you have longer limbs, and if you are particularly dexterous with your legs, weak side attacks are much easier to pull off. Um, strong side attacks don't require the same sort of uh, body type uh, adaptations. If you're built more like a fire plug or you know, shorter arms or not super flexible, you're going to go towards the strong side even more. I believe so, yes. Okay. Well, why don't we get started so people can see what we're talking about. Let's do strong side and weak side. Rob? What's the strong side of rear mount? The strong side is if I am right-handed, so my right arm is what we would call the killing hand, goes over your right shoulder, my left hand comes up and covers it. My strong side is when I drop to that side onto my right elbow. Uh, again, if you already have the back attacks formula, you know this, but just in case you don't, if I'm not on my elbow, this is not nearly as strong a side. If I'm here like this, you control my arm, you control my base, you have the ability to pull my arm across, and if it's the difference between this and weak side, I'll take weak side. But if I'm up here on my elbow, I've got base now, I can shoot my attacks more effectively, I can transition in and out of the back control, I can move to attacks on this side. So this is what we would define as the strong side. And so the weak side, conversely, would be over here. Exactly. So if I was just holding on with my direct rotational control, which is my seatbelt, then your option of escaping becomes greater. Uh, you can get your head to that side to scrape me off of you. So to prevent that, I need to have some kind of control. So that's what we're going to get into in uh, our weak side back attack series. All right, so if I find myself in back control and the options are strong side or weak side, I want, to try, I want you guys to try to think of it not so much as are we going to go to the strong or the weak side, but are we going to be able to create cross-body rotational control. So when I say cross-body, I mean bottom right hip, top left shoulder, bottom left hip, top right shoulder. Now, normally when we control the back, like I said earlier, it's direct. I'm using my hooks to directly pin your hip. I'm using my seat belt to directly pin your shoulders and attach my chest to your back, controlling your ability to turn. So now if I roll, you're coming with me. Okay. Exactly. If I go yeah. this way, I stay attached to you. So now if you're using more of a cross-body rotational control, you're still staying with me. I'm still staying with you. So in this case, I'm going to let my other hook out, and I'm going to control Kimura control style, not necessarily full Kimura control, so we usually call this motorcycle grip. And my seat belt, rather than gripping my own hand, I'll be gripping your hand two on one, like so. So you have this shoulder and this hip more or less under control. Exactly. And there are going to be a few different ways we can do the shoulder control. Uh, and a few different ways we can do the hip control, but for now I just need you to understand the basic lever mechanic here, controlling the elbow, and then as you go to the weak side here, I'm shooting the twister hook in. 
Now, in the back attacks formula, we were using this to reset the strong side here. In this case, when somebody goes to the weak side, we're going to be using this control and the fact that we can fold their elbow into their body to belly them down to attack the rear naked choke on the weak side. That's kind of the first attack, and it requires the least amount of modification of our back control. So again, I'm here, I feel you going to this side, I gain this control, or I already have this control because I'm going to initiate my cross body style attacks. So I get my twister hook, I'm using my left foot, may not be super visually apparent right now, but I'm using it for base so that I can extend and push with that left foot. You notice how your, hab the, like your instinct mm -hmm. is to post your hand to stop the rotation. As Soon as that happens, I'm either shooting the rear naked choke or going for your collar. I would recommend the rear naked choke here, both because it's translatable to gi and no gi, and it's just more effective for finishing uh, rather than trying to grab the collar. If I grab the collar, I usually have to reset us. I have to change position, whereas the rear naked choke is available right away. All right, so we, we mentioned earlier the idea of using the bottom corner and the top corner, so bottom right corner, top left corner, bottom left corner, top right corner, to create a cross-body rotational control. Um, we don't just have to use this as a weak side attack. This is a template for controlling, getting, and attacking the back. Uh, so for instance, if I've already, again, we just went over this, but to reiterate, if I've started with a seat belt and you're going to the weak side, I can choose to let you off and maneuver into this uh, cross-body lever-based rotational control. When I gain this, let's just rotate a little bit this way. Thank you. When I gain this, one of the positive effects is, a huge goal in back control is if you can ever belly your opponent down, that is the ultimate position. Right? Ryan Hall calls it the, the best position in the entire known universe, and I tend to agree. So if I can keep my partner's elbow from blocking his rotation to the left, I'm going to be able to turn him in that direction. So I'm going to use this double motorcycle grip in this case. I'm going to pull his elbow in, so I'm denying him a post to this side. I'm going to be using the lever control here, extending my leg, and I'm using my left foot for base, and I'm going to roll you into a belly down position. I'm going to tuck my head in as much as I can and use that same arrowhead style position to attack either the one arm rear naked choke, as we went over earlier, or the double lapel choke. Now that is a weak side attack. We are going to this side. However, if I find myself in this kind of uh, cross body style position, one of the other great bonuses of this is I can generate a rotation back to the strong side. So assuming that I've started to do this, I go to turn and maybe my partner overpowers me exactly, they plant their elbow to the mat. I'm now gonna start to use that lever based rotational control. I'm gonna place my foot on the mat. I'm gonna start to cut my hips to the right Bringing my partner, let's rotate back this way. Bringing my partner back to the strong side and attacking the rear naked choke in that one motion. So if we're facing here and I can't go weak side belly down, I flare the elbow out, plant my foot. I'm gonna be using my leg a little bit for extension here, coming up and shooting the choke in that one motion. An additional thing that's great about the strong side is if you are finding yourself in this sort of alignment where your partner is being really obnoxious and clamping your arm, is that you can use this leg additionally by pushing on the end of the elbow, or if you abduct your hips to create a proper angle here, just using your knee, which requires a lot less leg dexterity, therefore I'm more in favor of it. So pushing on the elbow to create this uh, lever effect, wedge mechanic, and then suck my elbow out mm -hmm. and finish the rear naked choke from there. So I actually oftentimes when I'm using this cross body style control, still go back to the strong side. It gives me more powerful options for finishing. And on the strong side, you still have the cross body control. You still have exactly. the, I still the have grip. Lever based control of the bottom right corner, lever based control of the top left corner. I still have that cross body. I frankly don't care if I get this hook in. Uh, you know, this is something that I kind of hip to a long time ago, which is people will over defend hooks to the expense of their neck under certain rule sets and people with certain like favorability in their training. So if you can ignore the temptation to sit here and have this battle, you're oftentimes going to be able to still finish the choke, bring this knee in to separate their arm and finish relatively easily without ever inserting your second hook and it's absolutely not a requirement or a rec prerequisite for finishing. Hey everyone, Stefan Kestick from grapplers.com. Rob Bernacki from Island Top Team, and this is Volume 2 
in our weak side control and attack instructional. Exactly. Um, so we went over in the last video the idea of the cross-body rotational control right. and just gave a, a quick yeah. example. Where you're controlling this leg or this hip and this shoulder and that allows you to stay with me. Exactly. Uh, so there are a few different ways we can achieve this uh, and the, the example that we gave was uh, it was a weak side attack in that we were going to the weak side but we weren't uh, shifting our control in any way. We already had the uh, motorcycle grip and we already had the twister hook and I was just using that to belly you down. Sure. Now, normally when you talk about weak side attacks, what we're talking about is me bringing my body here and doing uh, either a body triangle or pinning the hip in this fashion. So we want to go over uh, a couple things about how I'm going to control this top shoulder. Right? So the motorcycle grip was the first thing we discussed and this can be a single grip or it can be a double grip. We're going to go over the double grip when, uh, in a little more detail when we go over how to gain the choke. But for now, let's just worry about the single grip. So let's just sit back up. So if you watch EBI at all, you're going to know that in the overtime, whenever we start here, an almost immediate thing that has to occur if I want to maintain the back is this transition, either to the full body triangle or just to keeping the foot here. It's much more difficult. Uh, when you're in that scenario to, to maintain the control against people who are really good at escaping the back if you're just using individual hooks. So as far as what you're doing to control the hip in this case, when we start to go to the weak side, my right foot is stepping on the hip. That's limiting his ability to bridge. Normally when you escape to the weak side, you're lifting your hips and scraping your partner off you, using the floor to scrape them off of your back. So as soon as I recognize either that he's going that way or if I'm just choosing the weak side, uh, if I choose to develop a weak side back attack scheme, I may end up favoring it, particularly if I'm a longer, kind of lanky person. I'm going to step on the hip to keep him down and I'm going to transfer my foot across the hip and I want to be hooking my left foot. So now I've created the, the hip control that I need. So what we need to focus on now are, are the grips here. Motorcycle grip, double motorcycle grip shoulder cap, full Kimura grip, half Nelson, and claw ride. Those are the grips that we're going to be using to affect our top left shoulder or right shoulder if you're going on the other side. So you've got this hip control, somehow you need to control exactly. the controlling cross shoulder. Right, bottom right hip and my cross body control, I need to control the shoulder. If I'm not controlling the shoulder, the fact that I control your hip is not going to be enough to keep you exactly. So here. And if we already have this, we keep it. You can go to the shoulder here like this. And it's important when I'm shoulder capping that I'm not just gripping your shoulder. Because if I grip your shoulder and I don't control this lever, you're still going to be able to drive across. Yeah, exactly. So when I shoulder cap, I'm flaring. I'm using my left hand as an anchor point on top of your shoulder. Here you can grip the collar if you want to in the, in the gi and I'll isolate this arm, preventing it from making contact with the ground. So now if you want to try to move to that side, Much harder. it's really difficult. Now, usually when I teach this, I advocate the half Nelson even more so than the shoulder cap. Sometimes you can't get to this. If somebody's really driving their head in, you can't get the half Nelson to work. So the shoulder cap is an option. Like we can pretty much always have this. We can get to this. We can't always get to the half Nelson. So I don't say, you know, it's a prerequisite. But definitely, if we start here and you feel this is an option, go to the half Nelson because now I'm breaking your posture in addition to breaking your structure. So we're creating that uh, you know, three to nothing alignment, which is ideal for attacking submissions. Finally, once we've done this, we can easily transition to the Kimura control, which involves gripping the wrist, gripping my wrist, creating a frame between my shoulder and your neck with my elbow so that you can't close the distance and turn in, and creating this internal rotation of the shoulder, which as we discussed in any instruction that I've ever done on you know, the arm control, lever control. Anyway, if I can rotate your shoulder internally, I'm weakening you structurally to a much greater degree than if I'm just holding a cosmetic Kimura control. I need to keep your elbow off the ground, I need to push your hand towards the ground or your hip, and internally rotate your shoulder. People can probably see that my arm is in a Kimura position. I mean, it doesn't hurt. It's beginning to get a bit uncomfortable. Right. But what they might not feel is the frame that's against my neck. This is actually very uncomfortable. And it's the idea of getting my head all the way to the ground to scrape you off my back. Forget about it in this, in this uh, configuration. 
Exactly. No chance. Yeah. And a final configuration you can use is what's called a claw ride. Again, I have to keep this elbow off the mat. This immediately sets up the reverse Ezekiel if you're, uh, you know, if you're a gi guy. But and if you wanted to transition back to the strong side, you're now completely set up for your arm triangles, uh, any attack of that ilk. Right. So this is the one I use the least. This is the one I like to use the most, but is not always accessible. This is the one we can always get. This is the one we can always get. And if we get this, we can always get the Kimura control. So adjust them according to your personal preference, what you use, and to what is available. You don't want to try to put a square peg into a round hole, I've been told. So uh, if you're trying to force the half Nelson and it's not working, the Kimura control may become available or you may have to go back to the double motorcycle grip. All right, so I want to go over one example of this cross-body style of back attack just so you can see how uh, dynamic and powerful it is and how you can gain the back from positions you may not have thought possible. So a really good example of this is the top half guard. So I find myself in a situation where my partner wins the underhook and builds up to their elbow. Right? Normally I would have to wizard or pose, like I basically have to out-wrestle him at this point. So what I'm going to do instead is if I can capture his wrist, that's great. If not, I can still pull it off. I recommend trying to get this control anyway. I'm posting my right foot. I'm going to lean forward past his head to create the space to come in and get this motorcycle grip or double motorcycle grip. So I'm going to have this double motorcycle grip. I'm going to have my right foot posted. I'm going to withdraw my hand so you can see. I'm going to elevate my knee, pulling it out of the half guard so that I can pursue my roll. As I roll, my hip is going to trap his arm. Right? I don't want that arm there. So I'm going to start to walk off it and come into a seatbelt style configuration where I'm keeping this double motorcycle grip and my shoulder is going in behind his head. I'm now going to gain the twister hook. Right? You'll notice that I'm rolling all the way up onto my shoulder. I'm not trying to stay on my back. I don't care about chest to back connection so much anymore. Normally, when I'm controlling the back with a seatbelt, I want this chest to back connection as a critical prerequisite because it's direct rotational control. In the case of the cross body, I have lever based rotational control. So now if Stefan wants to turn into me, he can't because of this lever control here. If he wants to turn away from me, he can, which is why I need this arm blocking him. But if he brings his back to the mat, I don't really care as long as I can keep my shoulder over his neck by inserting my twister hook. And again, you'll notice I'm in a, I'm in a uh, perpendicular alignment with his shoulder but it doesn't really matter. Because of the power afforded by these levers, this lever and this lever, I can now slide my left knee up and hit a chair sit style hip escape to get onto the back. I can pursue the choke at any point in this. I don't have to throw the other hook in. But as long as I basically get this grip, I'm probably going to get on your back. That's very cool. That was the gateway drug to the back. There you go. So this is volume three of Rob's weak side back attack system. Yeah. What are we doing in, in this volume? Uh, in this volume, we're going to be working on how to trap the arm. Okay. And this is something that, you know, if you've been watching MMA for a while, you've seen BJ Penn do multiple mm -hmm. times. You've seen Marcelo, Marcelo Garcia, I think I got his name right, uh, do this on multiple Very occasions. Cool. Uh, this is something that I used to struggle with a lot because frankly, I'm not that flexible. And certainly the method, that, particularly that BJ Penn uses, and then you see, like, this is not a you know, secret technique, everyone teaches push the arm down, trap, the, uh, trap it with your leg. So uh, I think I've got something that will help uh, people who aren't super flexible trap the arm. But well, certainly flexibility is an aspect. It's certainly going to help, yeah. I mean, I'll be honest, I still struggle to trap the arm because of the lack of leg dexterity. This has helped immensely, though. Before it was impossible. Now I can do it. Okay. So, over here. So, we've got ourselves. Again, let's just slide it down. Just a bit. There we go. Okay. So, again, stepping on the hip, transferring, controlling the top shoulder with some variation of this. Which we covered in the last video. Which we covered in the last video, exactly. So now I want to trap this arm with this leg. Normally, if we were just on the weak side here and I'm trying to throw this leg, again, it's possible if I'm really dexterous with my legs. But if somebody's really doing a good job being diligent and not allowing me to get here, there's a certain level of flexibility required below which it just won't work. 
if I have this angle here, so I've controlled the hip, I've tucked in to make sure that this shoulder can't get to the mat, and I've created a lever-based control on this side. Now, ideally, well I shouldn't say ideally, optimally for him, he's going to be connecting his hands. Right? If he doesn't connect his hands, and he's, his arms are separated, then I'm just immediately going to the armbar. So once we get this foot across, and we have some kind of internal rotation or some kind of lever-based control here, it's in our partner's best interests to connect their hands. So we can kind of take that as a given. If they don't connect their hands, then we're simply catching the end of the lever, pushing the head away, breaking the posture and attacking the armbar, which we're going to get into a little bit later. So we're going to start with the presumption that our partner is connecting their hands because they're wary of that threat as we present it. We're going to make sure that our hip is at enough of an angle, our leg that's not controlling the hip is creating a kickstand to push our partner onto their side a little bit more. And then I want to be able to bring my hamstring and back of my knee over top of your shoulder. So instead of using a, an external rotation of the hip motion to try to bring my heel in on your forearm, I'm just doing a leg press. So you no longer need to do the full lotus. Exactly, exactly. So. Let's say double motorcycle grip is happening. The more I'm able to lift this top arm to create a pocket, the better. So for this particular attack, the double motorcycle grip is favorable because I'll be able to pull this up a little bit. All right? So when I pull this up and I bring my hamstring over top of your shoulder to create a shoulder cap, I can put my heel in your wrist. The crook of the bicep works all right, but the problem with that is it's the end of the lever to the shoulder but it's not the end of the lever to the wrist, so there's, mm -hmm. it's acting as a, as a hinge at this point. Right? I want to be able to try to get my foot in here to create the break. Right? When I want to create the break, there are a couple of things that I can uh, kind of mess around with. The half Nelson really breaks posture, so this is one of the reasons that I favor it if I can get it. Because if I'm here and you're particularly strong, yeah, it's, it's really, it can still be difficult to kick this free. But once I get here and I break your posture, this weakens the, your kinetic chain as we've discussed in the core concepts app. And now I've isolated your arm. I can track my foot to the inside of your hip and ribs, mm -hmm. creating, because if I just try to do this, sometimes you'll be able to flip your arm out. If I just cross my ankles over, like, given enough time, you will get your arm back in there. But if I've got my foot across and I tuck my foot mm -hmm. in underneath, then there's no way you're getting that arm back. So your instep is against the small of my back. Here, there's no way I can find that hole there. Exactly. Now again, I can choose any number of attacks. We're going to go over how to uh, attack the chokes a little bit later. But once I've got this, once I've trapped the arm, the options are to continue on into the arm bar. Right? So I can come around like this, sit you up, block your arm, finish with the arm bar. Alternately, you can move to the triangle. Again, we're going to go over in greater detail all the different finishes once we've gotten this to occur or we're in the process of getting this to occur. The most important thing for this video is just getting here and how do we maintain that control, which is keeping our foot tucked in, keeping this extension of the arm, and then whatever attacks we want to go to. All right, so once again, I highly recommend when you're learning something new, especially when you're drilling it, that you go through uh, an auditory cue, or you can even just say it in your head, but go through the steps. So step on the hip, cover the hip, tuck in, control the shoulder, break posture if possible, angle your hip out, stomp on the wrist, bringing the back of your knee and hamstring over the shoulder so that you're creating a leg press, and then tuck your foot underneath the hip or ribs, doing a slight kind of inward, uh, you know, Suzanne Summers thigh master style movement here to maintain the control of the shoulder. And then you can go back to whichever grip is most favorable for the attack you're going to choose. Greetings, Internet. I'm Rob Bernacki. This is Stefan Kesting. This is going to be volume four of our weak side slash cross body control style uh, back attacks. Uh, so in the previous video, we went over how we're arriving at the arm trap. Um, and now we're going to go over how to transition to the triangle. So if I'm maneuvering, just a couple, there we go. 
If I'm maneuvering into the weak side, I'm stepping on the hip, I'm capping off the shoulder. Ideally, we're adding some kind of posture break, but if not, that's just fine. I'm using my foot for base here to create uh, a kickstand effect. I'm scooting my hip out. Again, I can transition to the Kimura, or I can stay here. For now, let's say I've transitioned to the Kimura. Now, rather than using leg dexterity, I'm using a simple leg press to get over my partner's arm and trap it. So now we want to transition to the triangle. Now the thing about transitioning to the triangle is I don't actually have to get this arm trap. There are going to be situations where my partner is doing a really good job of keeping this arm in and I'm not actually going to be able to necessarily trap the arm with my foot like the, I'll just oblige me to say, yeah, underneath the hip. So occasionally we're going to find ourselves here and we're going to transition to the triangle without being able to trap the arm. So let's so discuss that right first. over my wrist there. Exactly. So I'm, just as we discussed in the previous video, I'm trying to get to the end of the lever with my heel, although sometimes I'm going to have to use uh, the bicep as the end of a different lever. But in this case, I'm covering your wrist, and I'm going to angle my hip as much up to the side as I can. Let's turn. So that my, roughly speaking, my Achilles tendon is covering your wrist. The more of an internal rotation I have on your shoulder here, the better. And I'm now going to close the triangle. Now, if your arm is trapped in here, that's actually great for me. That's horrendous. My it's own horrible. hands are choking me. Yeah. Um, now, let's just go over a few details on the actual triangle. I don't want to close the triangle at this angle. There's going to be space between the, the sort of uh, bend of my knee and Stefan's neck. Ideally, you know, any choke is a triangle, but the triangle has to be lined up correctly. So right now, the angle is wrong. The triangle is going over the back of your neck and your shoulder here. I want the triangle to be going over the side of your neck and internally rotating your shoulder. So I want to make sure that I scoot back enough that my calf caps off these arteries and that my hip flexor top of my thigh is driving your shoulder into your neck like this. So you can see there for demonstration purposes, I didn't close the triangle, just so you could see the motion. I would be closing the triangle in this case, and ideally, if I could hook under your arm and start to come up, I'm adding a posture break, mm -hmm. making the triangle tighter. Not necessary, particularly if you don't have really long legs and a lot of space to try to take away. You don't have to do that sit apart, but it's certainly helpful, much like pulling the head down if you're doing a triangle from the guard is helpful. But as long as I'm here and I have the proper angle, I should be able to finish no matter what. So that's the first triangle setup, which again, it doesn't require the arm being trapped, but if it's trapped, then great. The second triangle setup that we want to go over, once we found ourselves here, particularly if I have managed to create this separation and I've trapped the arm, is I can control this arm in a few different ways, or I can simply step my leg across and extract my other leg. So now I'm going to a more conventional triangle alignment. Now in this case, there are two options. While I do this, my partner is either going to stay here, in which case when I close the triangle, it is going to be a little bit of a different angle. You'll notice again that I'm closing the triangle here rather than bringing it all the way around to the conventional triangle alignment. Right? Now that is contingent on you. Sure. So it's like an, a regular triangle if I, for some stupid reason, Try to escape by twisting up this way. Exactly. So I would be ending, ending up going here. Ah, ah. Right. And I would pay for that. Difference. For that, yeah, yeah, for that mistake. Right. So there's so, two But in this case, triangles. because you're on your side and you may not even have the ability to turn into me, right? Like, let's go over it one more time because, you know, we say sometimes the guy will turn into you. It's entirely possible that they won't even be able to. Right? Once I've done this, especially if I've added this posture break, I've stepped here, and then I've transitioned. As long as I'm keeping this elbow up, it can be very difficult for you. So I don't want you to make unnecessary movements if you don't have to. I keep the posture break. I can break posture this way as well. I close the triangle. I make sure that my Achilles tendon, where it connects to my calf, this, the, the, the tendon insertion, is cutting off this artery. I make sure that my hip comes out enough that your shoulder is going to be rotating into your neck and I break your posture oh. with my thigh. So that would be how we finish the triangle on that side. So there are two main triangles from the weak side. In yes, in, in one case I'm throwing my right leg over 
and triangling this way. In the other case, I'm throwing my left leg over and triangling this way. They're both very effective. Hi, this is part five of the weak side attack and control system. So what are we doing in part five? In part five, we're going to be transitioning to the arm bar. Okay. Yeah, you see this all the time in uh, submission grappling and EBI and things like that. Absolutely. And this can come off of Kimura control the way it's conventionally done, but we've got a couple little twists on it that I think people might enjoy. Cool. So we're here, and for whatever reason, so again, we've gone through the sequence, I've stepped on your hip, I'm controlling the bottom right hip, and I'm controlling the top left shoulder. I'm creating like a cap on your hip with a little bit of tension here, and I'm angling my hip out so that there's kind of a, a space for you to fall into so that I can keep you from rotating past me with this lever control. So I'm creating this kickstand effect, which is, for one, limiting your movement, and two, providing me base. So if I need to shift myself around, I'm using my contact with the ground with my right foot to do it. Right. This is also allowing me now to adjust my hip out so that I can start to bring the back of my hamstring and knee over your shoulder into a leg press alignment. Now, if somebody is not connecting their hands, anytime we do, if they're more concerned about the choke here, that's fantastic. When we do this, we should be able to just remove their arm from their body using the Kimura control. So when I say using the Kimura control, what I'm doing is I'm gripping at the wrist and partially on the hand. So not just at the wrist, but I want to be gripping into, there's a, a connection between the, the radius and the ulna, which are the bones in your forearm, and the space in your wrist, uh, which I believe is called the carpal tunnel, uh, where it connects to your fingers. So we want to be gripping into that space so that I can use your hand as a lever to rotate internally and externally uh, via a ratchet effect, your shoulder. So there's my Kimura grip. I'm gripping my own wrist. In this case, I'm using my thumb when I need to separate, and then I'm removing my thumb once I've achieved the grip. So I'm gripping with my thumb to create this rotation, and then I'm controlling at the wrist around the hand. This is keeping your elbow from touching the ground. It's providing me with the ability to deny you base. And now, if your hands are not connected, I simply swing my leg around your head. Now when I say swing my leg, I'm not using a giant kind of leg dexterity flexibility movement. What I'm doing is I'm using that kickstand which is providing you support. I'm pushing you towards it with my right elbow, and then I'm gonna make that kickstand disappear, which is dropping you to the mat. Now I can bring my leg around your head without any further you know, Cirque du Soleil antics. All right? Once I've done this and I've got the Kimura control here, let's just rotate a little bit so people can see the posture break. Turn, 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 turn. All right. So I got myself here. I'm pushing you with my elbow, the kickstand disappears, and I cover your head, so I'm breaking your posture. My right heel is curling into my butt, and I'm pulling and extending your arm away. I'm now gonna switch my grip, so that I'm gripping the back of your hand with the palm of my hand. My thumb is going around the back of your, uh, the bottom of the knife edge of your hand. My fingers are going around your thumb, or into the web of your thumb, whatever happens to be available, and I'm keeping your thumb pointed down at your feet. I keep the curl here, and my right uh, inside of my uh, hamstring kind of groin area is going to be driving down on your shoulder. So I'm creating immobilization of your shoulder joint, immobilization of your shoulder girdle and your neck, and I'm simultaneously breaking your posture. At this point, I'm going to start to squeeze my knees together. I can bring my heel in, I can bring it against your ribs. What's most important is that the, the, the humerus which is the bone in your upper arm, doesn't move, so I'm immobilizing the elbow joint. Once I've done that, I'm going to take the slack out of the joint, so I don't want to try to break your arm yet. I'm going to pull, extending like I'm trying to pull your shoulder out of the socket. I'm going to make sure there's a rotation just enough that your thumb is pointed out. I don't want to over-rotate because then when I bridge in, your elbow's going to bend. So I'm going to go about halfway. Once I've done that, I'm keeping the extension pulling with my hand that's gripping your hand. My other hand is going to come around and rear naked choke grip. So I'm coming around your wrist creating control at the end of the lever. Once I've done that, almost no hip motion should be necessary. Mm -hmm. If you have to bridge like crazy to finish an armbar, especially in training, you're doing it wrong. Extension, rotation, posture break, shoulder immobilization, and a little bit of a hug is all you need. Very similar to your idea of applying a heel hook, that if you get all the fine tuning on the grip right, 
and all the and taking all the slack out of the system everywhere else. You almost don't need to bridge. You almost don't need to rotate. Exactly. Like we, we touched on this a little bit in the Core Concepts uh, app. Uh, I've certainly, when I've been teaching seminars recently, regardless of the joint lock that I've been teaching, I've been emphasizing this concept of breaking mechanics where we're using extension, rotation, taking the slack out of the joint, and making sure that there are no uh, sources of bleeding pressure, right? Uh, joints can act as shock absorbers mm -hmm. if there's motion possible. So I want to take all of that away before I activate my hips. The, the hip motion, the bridge is the last thing you should do. Although obviously in competition, it all happens at once. You're going to be bridging immediately. But particularly in the learning process, for the sake of your own development and for the sake of the safety of your training partner's limbs, we want to make sure that we're going sequentially. Extension, rotation, taking the slack out of the joint, pulling it out, and then applying the bridging pressure. Wanna, just to go back a little bit, yeah. uh, for the weak side to arm bar transition, yeah. you talked about the different grips that you can have. I'd like you to review all of them. Just Yeah, so absolutely. Them. And let's go over what happens when our partner is connecting their hands, because we went over the assumption that somebody is over defending the chokes and not connecting their hands. So let's go over those two things. Okay, so to quickly review the different gripping sequences, as I move to the weak side, I have the shoulder cap, I have the double motorcycle grip, the single motorcycle grip, I have the full Nelson, I have the claw ride, and then I have the Kimura control. If we're going to be moving into the arm bar, I recommend the Kimura grip as the source of our attack, or at the very least, a single motorcycle grip, in which case I'd be transitioning a little bit to a control of the hand, and we would still have to have some kind of brace here, some kind of frame. Because if I were to try, you know, like claw grip to an arm bar, uh, there's just, there's no real lever-based rotational control of the shoulder. So it's less about the specifics of the grip than it is about the concept that I have to be able to create this internal rotation where I'm pushing down to create a ratchet effect to rotate your humerus to internally rotate your shoulder. Right? So that's the first thing. So if we were, let's say, doing a double motorcycle grip, I don't have a frame between us. So if I were to try to like unweave my arm and it just wouldn't work unless my opponent is asleep at the switch and that's not what we're going for here. We want stuff that works on everybody or as close to everybody as we can get. So I would make sure that I create a frame and I can use the Kimura grip or I can keep the, um, the single motorcycle grip here. Kickstand effect. That's an eye. There's no way I can bring my head close to you because I'm trying to push through the length of your humerus. Exactly. So now I now let's just uh, so now we've addressed the grips. So again, ideally Kimura grip. Like this is realistically this is the only one I use. You 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 can get away with it using the motorcycle grip, but you're unnecessarily weakening yourself by not just connecting your hands and creating a closed circuit, which amplifies your kinetic chain. When your hands are connected, when your ankles are crossed, you are more powerful than when your limbs act separately. So once we've got this, we've got that kickstand effect. Now let's say that you are connecting your hands now. So I'm trying to push you down, and in this case, because I see that your hands are connected, I don't just want to drop you into the arm bar and fight for you separating your hands. That's, it's just an unnecessary battle. I can win that battle, but why fight unnecessary battles? So here, blocking, I'm gonna come over the shoulder, I'm gonna step on your wrist as much as possible. If all I can get is the bicep, that's fine too, but try to get as close to the wrist as you can. Now we're going to affect a posture break where I'm using the back of my elbow or I'm using my hand with the, uh, the full Nelson type grip. And that's going to enable me to break your uh, hand connection. Now I can move into the arm bar again, grabbing the back of the hand, extending, pinching off the shoulder, and starting to apply the arm lock. And so part of the reason this transition is so fast is because this foot is it's, already, is already in, across that, the in that position. Yeah. So to, to pull off this move from the sort of the traditional... Uh, it, it's, it's certainly possible. possible. People have done it, but you're relying on speed and athleticism uh, and timing, which, I mean, those are all great things to have as a high-level athlete, but if you're building your game off of it, uh, you run into somebody who's got more chemical assistance in that department, you're, you're likely to fail. Okay. What if you're triangling your legs and you're trying to do this attack, so now this, yeah, this so leg this is point, more tied up? Yeah. We'd be here, all right? So if I created all of this, it would still just require me to undo the triangle. Now, when I say undo the triangle, I don't mean undo it and race to the armbar, because you can see how compromised the alignment of my leg is right now. I can certainly finish here sometimes, 
but against a much larger opponent, I would not recommend it. So we would just transition from the full body triangle to this angle again, creating that kickstand effect, dropping our partner into the hole, and then attacking the armbar from there. Hey guys, this is volume six of the weak side control and attack instructional. Go watch the other sections first, because then you'll understand what we're talking about. But we're talking about moving from the weak side to the crucifix. Yes, and this is a this is a niche movement. I'm not going to pretend like this is going to be part of your A game. Um, although if your A game is the crucifix, you may choose to take it here if you have more experience. Um, but there are going to be a few scenarios, particularly and you know for all of my enemies in PC land, there's no way around this. If you're a big fat guy, sometimes you're going to be able to pop people's legs off of you in the back control in a way that makes the the domination of the hip and the weak side a little difficult. So I want you to channel your inner. Chief. Uh, yeah, Chief. Buddha belly. <laughs> okay. I'm just gonna say, channel your inner American, but that's not gonna cut it. So, <laughs> so I got myself here. I trapped the arm through the the sequence that we went over earlier, and this foot here that's hooking the hip. Again, if you yeah, I lost it. Or I'm just choosing to go to the crucifix. So I'm gonna remove my foot, and I have to start to tuck it in. Now, if I'm choosing the crucifix. This can be a little bit tricky because if our partner is heavy enough, getting him to move off of our leg, it's, it's not up to me. He kind of has to choose. So I have to start to withdraw my leg while he's trying to go in that direction. When he does, I've already got usually the Kimura control here. I'm going to switch to the uh, motorcycle grip on the edge of the hand and I need to reach through here and grab your wrist. For the method that we're talking about today, just holding the arm here is not going to be good enough. We were using kind of a version 2.0 of the crucifix, which involves controlling the wrist and putting the bend of our, or putting the bend of our partner's elbow, sorry, against my ankle and the bottom of my shin, almost like I'm trying to do a bicep slicer. Don't bother with the submission here, it's unlikely to work. But what I'm going to now be able to do is bring my bottom leg over your wrist and place my foot against my calf. So I'm now <laughs> kimura you with my legs. All right? So as long as I have this control, I can afford to let go and start to grip here. I'm withdrawing my knee. It's important for this that my arm be inside of the space between your head and my thigh. I can't go like this and withdraw my legs sufficiently. So I'm reaching in between and grabbing your wrist or grabbing the back of your hand. Anything that adds rotational control is usually a good idea. I'm withdrawing my foot as far as I can get it until the bottom of your forearm is resting against my instep. And then I'm going to start to push down so that I can cover my own hand with the back of my left knee. I'm now going to cover and extend so that my right foot is touching my calf. So I'm basically creating a leg press or like a double leg press alignment. My left foot is going on the mat. I can, we'll go over dig mechanics for the choke in another video but I can start attacking the choke from here, definitely. I can return to some kind of Kimura control or double motorcycle grip. And then my goal, as far as the finish is concerned, is to stay close to you with my shoulders and my chest and start moving my hips away as I, and I'm just gonna let you out of this so I can demonstrate the hip movement here stuff. As I scoop my hip away, I'm trying to rotate my right hip, the top hip up, and withdraw my left hip. So I'm imparting a Kimura style rotation to your arm. So as with most crucifix style attacks, if I'm losing my mind defending my arm, it opens my neck up. Absolutely. If I'm totally defending my neck, opens my arm up. It's, it's a f frying pan and fire type situation. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to cover the chokes from there. We're going to cover the chokes from there and from all of the different weak side back attack options uh, in our final volume. Uh, but this is just, it's a, it's a good option and it's also, it just gave me an opportunity to teach this like 2.0 version uh, crucifix, which I haven't really seen uh, demonstrated at this point, so I was just hoping to add some value to people. Sure. Let's show it one more time from the angle, please, Rob. Yeah. So assuming that I got myself to the weak side, I'm dominating the shoulder here, creating lever control, I'm controlling the hip, I have managed to step over the shoulder, extend and find my foot inside either because my partner bridges, and if my partner bridges, then it's very easy to go to the uh, uh, crucifix, I believe it's called. If my partner doesn't bridge, uh, you may get stuck here, so just be aware of that. Now, my hand is coming in between my leg and my partner's neck. I've transitioned from the Kimura grip to the single motorcycle grip, 
ideally more on the hand, and I'm gripping the hand, withdrawing my foot. So I was, usually you're gonna be pretty deep, almost knee deep under the forearm. So make sure that your hand goes in between and you withdraw to the ankle. Scoot your hips as much as is necessary to place your thigh in your partner's armpit. I wanna be a little bit closer to his right side because if I'm too far away, I'm gonna to have to use leg dexterity. And as, if you've ever heard me teach before, I'm not a big fan of leg dexterity. Not that it's bad, but you shouldn't base your game on it. Control the wrist, scoot down, bring your left leg. Again, this isn't a big leg dexterity movement. I'm just bringing my knee towards me, controlling your wrist with a frame with my right arm, and then placing in a very natural leg press type movement, the back of my knee over your wrist, and I'm connecting my foot, my right foot to my calf, placing my left foot on the mat to derive base. I start scooting as slowly as I can, bringing both my knees towards the ground and lifting and rotating my butt. And that should get you the tap on the leg Kimura. Greetings everybody, I'm Rob Bernacki from Island Top Team. This is Stefan Kesting from GrappleArts.com and this is gonna be the final video in our weak side slash cross body rotational control, back attack, control, and attack, and attack, and back system. <laughs> We're going to be going over really the thing that you should be trying to do when you're on someone's back, which is choking them and finishing, that, finishing them that way. Uh, the choke, as you may or may not know, is the most effective and reliable submission out there. There are people who will choose to continue fighting if you've broken their arm or their leg. Very few people can choose to continue fighting when they're unconscious. So that should be our ultimate goal anyway. So let's say we found ourselves on the weak side here, so let's just rotate a little bit, there we go. So we stepped on the hip, we got to here, we got our Kimura control or our double wrist control, uh, double motorcycle grip, or our claw ride, or our uh, half Nelson. We'll go through entries from kind of every place. We'll start with if we don't have the arm trap, because we're gonna be in a situation where we've got this foot on the mat, and we're trying to trap the arm. It may happen, it may not happen. But if I'm, especially if I've got the double wrist control here and my partner is connecting their hands because they don't immediately want to be arm barred. Again, as we went through in an earlier video, if someone's not connecting their hands, then the best thing to do is drop them into the hole and take their arm. But again, as I mentioned, the choke is the better option. So you may find yourself going up against someone who's got really good arm bar defense. And even though that option exists, you don't want to take it. So if we find ourselves here, we're stepping with our kickstand against our partner's hip. We've created an angle so we're underneath our partner's shoulder. If our partner is not connecting their hands, it's usually going to be because they're keeping their hand very, very close to their neck. All right? So the first thing I want to show you, and this is a dig mechanic for the choke that will apply no matter where you're at. You could be on the strong side. It could be any form of back attack where we're able to keep our chin close to our partner's shoulder, and we can do it from a seat belt. But the idea is that something is usually gonna be blocking here and we need a way to get our hand in here. So we're gonna make what I usually refer to as an arrowhead. So I'm gonna take the, uh, my, I believe this is my index finger, I'm gonna place it around my thumb. So I'm creating a reinforced wedge that I'm gonna drive underneath my partner's jawbone. Now, this is all fine and good. There's a bunch of different ways. You know, Some people use the thumb, some people use the knuckle. Everyone's got a method that they use to get underneath the jaw. The problem with any of those and all of them as far as I've found is that the head is not braced. So as I'm moving, you can be absorbing the force I'm generating. So what we're gonna do to affect the, you know, limit that effect is I'm gonna make like I'm trying to make out with Stefan. I'm gonna put my chin. I am so gonna edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna put my chin right against his neck to create a brace, a frame, preventing his head from moving. And now I'm gonna use that arrowhead, and you, you can put your hand there, start you tuck your chin in, and you're gonna notice that it's really difficult, right, for you to stop that hand from coming in. The presence of your head stops me able exactly. to move and... And it's not just, because I can put my head here, and if I'm doing the same yeah. thing, you can still, yeah. Anytime you can shrug your shoulders and move your neck, as we discussed in the arm bar uh, video, your joints can act as shock absorbers. So in this case, your neck, is gonna act as a shock absorber moving around while I try to dig underneath your jaw. So I'm gonna use my lantern style rogue jaw here to create a brace so that you can't move your head. I'm also gonna be using this top leg here to pinch you, to drive your entire body 
into that sort of bulwark so you cannot move. And then now that I've done that, I can get to digging underneath your chin. So this is not, again, it's not just weak side stuff, although it works particularly well on this side because my head is braced by the floor and by my own shoulder. Whereas when you go to like a neutral or strong side alignment, I'm relying on gravity to do it, which is fine, but it, I find that it's actually not quite as powerful. So, but you can use it everywhere. You can use it, we've used it a lot at our academy just when we get to this sort of neutral position and then quickly getting through to here. So it doesn't matter how or when you use it, it's a method of getting under the chin and getting to the choke. So it doesn't matter if you're sinking for the rear naked, for sort of a short choke or short for choke, collar, collar choke. choke. It doesn't matter what the attack is. You know, collar choke, it's easy. The rear naked choke is the hardest because you got to go the farthest. But once you get that wedge mechanic going, it works pretty well. So then what are the highest percentage chokes on the weak side? Yes. Like the actual choke. So the one-armed rear naked choke, because I'm going to be... So one of the limitations of the weak side, and this is still... Uh, like I actually think a bit, pretty big limitation is that if you want to trap this arm and just be super obnoxious, you can do it. So I have to cultivate a one-armed rear naked choke. In the gi, this is a little bit easier to do because I've offered so many places to grip. In no gi, I just have to grip your trapezius muscle uh, or your scapula if I can reach it. All right, but let's assume, for instance, that I use my gi as an anchor point here. I'm going to be closing my elbow, but not just closing my elbow. I need to be driving my shoulder into your head. If all I do is close my elbow and I'm retreating my upper body, then there's no posture break and there aren't two walls closing in. So I want to be driving my shoulder in, anchor to my gi, or, and don't try to reach for your own shoulder. That's not really going to work unless you've got really long arms, and even then the angle is going to be wrong. So it's either my gi or your trapezius muscle shoulder. My head is in tight, my shoulder is coming forward, and I'm closing my elbow, not just straight back, but down and then flexing. Another important note about chokes, especially with the rear naked choke, is don't squeeze early. Be as relaxed as you can be until you get exactly the position you want. It's kind of like uh, putting the water into a hose. A hose is pliable when there's no water pressure in it. You can wrap it around nice and tight. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to be as relaxed as I can, get as deep as I can with everything, and then I turn the pressure on, and hopefully that'll help you with getting a finish on that one-armed rear naked choke. In addition to the one-armed rear naked choke, if we're using this uh, arrowhead style position, we get the grip on the collar. Right? We won't be able to usually get as deep as we would like. It's going to be a bit of a shallow grip, but the, the farther you can get around behind your partner's neck, the better. You're going to open the lapel up as much as you can to create this profile with your wrist. I don't want to try to choke you with this wide, thick top side of my wrist. I want to choke you with my radial bone. So when I go in here and I do that, I grab the collar and I rotate it, that exposes my wrist to that uh, artery on the left side of your neck. Now I'm going to come in and I'm going to find your opposite side lapel and I'm going to try to zip it down as far as I can and push my head in as far as I can before I attempt to choke you. When I do go to choke you, this is where I would prefer to transition to the strong side. So although it's quite finishable here, like yeah, this is absolutely, once I get this zip effect and start to squeeze my elbow, I can absolutely finish you. But for additional power, I would recommend reinserting this hook stepping on the mat, hip escaping, finding myself on this side. What that's going to allow me to do is drop Stefan's head into this space between my elbow and my bicep and my shoulder. On the other side, I was kind of trapped in this alignment. Here, I now have a more effective posture break. As I create that zip effect, I can use way less energy and effort to finish on the choke here. All right, so we have two more chokes to go over provided we have not trapped the arm, and then we'll go over what we're doing when we've got the arm trapped. So again, if I maybe started with my seat belt, started to move to my uh, double motorcycle grip, stepped on the hip, got myself to here, and then I used that arrowhead style dig and I got myself onto the collar. We just went over the double lapel choke, now we're gonna go over the bow and arrow choke. If I've got this grip, I'm just gonna extend out so that I can anchor the pants as close to the knee as I can, I'm gonna start to pull up. I'm using that kickstand leg to angle my hip out just enough so that my shoulder can come in behind your neck. And now I'm going to use that stepping over the shoulder motion 
to cap off this side to start to push you away as I withdraw my right elbow and press my shoulder into the back of your head. Again, an important distinction here, there's nothing wrong with this version of the bow and arrow choke. I just find that it takes a lot more energy uh, and you don't want to burn your grips out if you have to have multiple matches. So if I'm able to get here, it's a more efficient choke mechanic. And then in particular, if I'm able to cap your shoulder off and push away, dropping the shoulder down, it tightens the noose even further. And then the other choke that we're gonna use and when we're finding ourselves without this arm trap is the reverse Ezekiel. So if we sit up for a second here, um, in particular, this goes very well with the half Nelson. So if I get to here and I'm using the half Nelson attack, I'm gonna bring my arm around your neck so that I'm thumb deep. So if I make that kind of thumbs up position, uh, again, if you've ever been to one of my seminars, usually especially when I teach leg locks, it's who's gonna leg lock somebody? This guy, so in this case, it's gonna be who's gonna Ezekiel somebody? This guy, I point my thumb at me. I'm gonna grab my sleeve. Different recommendations from different people as to how many fingers. I don't like putting four fingers in simply because it crushes my knuckles. Two is what I found optimal. Three is great, whatever works for you. Like I said, I just don't like the restriction, especially if it's uh, narrow sleeves that comes with four. So three or two is great. I'm gonna be hiding my elbow, but first, I'm gonna place my forearm on the back of your head. It doesn't have to go all the way through here like this. Again, I know a lot of people teach these vehicles like this. It totally works, but especially if you've got slightly either shorter limbs or narrower sleeves, this is gonna be plenty. I'm hiding my elbow and finishing on the choke. So once again, I'm stepping on the hip, covering the hip, angling off, and I'm using the half Nelson motion here. I can also cover your head as I do it. Rule of thumb. Thumb behind the neck, grab your sleeve. Place it behind the neck and start withdrawing your elbow as you go. This is another choke, by the way, that I would recommend finishing on the strong side. So if I were to find myself here, I'd be switching, angling off so I can build base. Let's rotate around the other side. So I'm angling off so that I can build base. This allows me now way more control with my shoulder to push your shoulder into oh, your yeah. neck. It's a much, much more powerful finish on the strong side. I would venture to say that I never finish on the weak side, although I do know it's possible, but I've cultivated the habit of bringing my elbow into base, switching to the strong side, and I would recommend you do the same. I'm not saying you can't on the other side, but again, you can feel the difference when I drive that shoulder Ow. in and hide my elbow. It's a much more powerful choke. Okay, our final choke options are gonna come off of when we have separated the arms uh, and trapped the top arm with our, in this case, right leg. So let's say that I used the double motorcycle grip in this case. I angled my hip off so that I could stomp over your shoulder. And if your hands were connected, I'm trying to separate them and then tuck my foot underneath. When I tuck my foot underneath, what you'll notice is that I'm now able to bring myself back into a more conventional back control alignment. Normally with the weak side attacks, I'm pretty much underneath your shoulder, trying to control this lever, trying to break your posture, do all this stuff, create the angle to trap your arm. But once I have trapped your arm, staying here is not the best angle for the choke dig because again, your neck can move around and because I'm not creating any block here, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But once I bring myself back under here, and I can use that double or single motorcycle grip and bring my chin, and again, I'm trying to place the point of my chin right there and have the sides of my jaw fitting uh, like a, a Tetris piece to block your head. Now that I've done that, it should be a relatively easy task to use that arrowhead to dig underneath. We can go double lapel choke. We can certainly go bow and arrow choke. My arm is already over. I sit up to do it, so again, I'm not doing this. This will work, but it's gonna take more energy. So I'm keeping my shoulder behind your chin, sitting up as I withdraw your shoulder and withdraw my elbow, projecting my shoulder forward. If I'm looking for the rear naked choke, once I get here, in this case, because I have rotational control, I can adjust you enough mm. to get the full rear naked choke. If I don't have this, it can be tricky to move, like once I get under here, it can be tricky to move you enough to get this arm free. But once I have this arm trap, even if you're being fairly obnoxious, I can move you by using that lever to rotate you, pull my arm out, and go back to my rear naked choke. 
which I'm grabbing on bicep. Um, in the gi, it's actually a really good idea to grab your sleeve as far around as you can get it and grab your gi up here. It's a more solid anchor point because again, we're creating a closed circuit. In no gi, obviously, you're not gonna have the option of doing that. Grip as far around as you can, placing ideally your wrist in the pit of your bicep, not just gripping your bicep. This can slip. This is unlikely to slip. It's a more direct lever mechanic. And then here I'm walking my fingers down my spine as I expand my chest and squeeze my head towards yours, bringing my elbows together to affect the choke. So those are our choke options. Bow and arrow, really easy. Rear naked choke, either one arm or using the lever style to free my arm and proper two arm rear naked choke. All of those are extremely reliable finishes and what you should mainly be focusing on getting with this style of attack. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Rob. I think that was a really informative uh, segment and number of segments about the weak side. Let's just reiterate one more time, sort of like you're, if you're going against some guy, what helps you determine whether or not you're going to go strong side or weak side? Yeah, absolutely. In, uh, in, the, in the back. Uh, body type, certainly. The, the, the more girthy somebody is, the less likely I am to go to the weak side. Um, but other than that, it, it does come down to how they defend themselves. Some people have a style of defense that involves what we call at our academy, taking your ball and going home. Uh, those people are not super concerned with getting out of a position. They're just concerned with not getting finished. Uh, in cases like that, if I go to the strong side and they just latch onto my arm as hard as they can, it can be a little bit more difficult. Uh, because again, I'm applying direct control uh, and I don't have the multiplying force of the lever. So in situations like that, I do find it helpful to bring them to the weak side, start attacking this internal rotation on this arm or creating a posture break here, and then I can work my attack series. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks so much. No worries.